we consider this to be the sort of big theorem in, in linear algebra. Uh, this big theorem tells us, and we see this a lot in linear algebra actually, that, that if one statement is true, there are a series of other equivalent statements. Uh, this may or may not seem obvious sometimes, though in any case it does require some justification and, and reasoning. So we're not going to give a formal proof for this, but we'll kind of lay out the, the idea to see how all of these ideas that we've learned so far, and these multiple representations, can lead us to see that these conclusions are the same. So let A be some M by N matrix. The following statements are equivalent. Now, these aren't always true, but as long as one of them is true, then then they they are all true. Okay, so let's start off with assuming that the first statement is is indeed true. Okay, we'll say that this is a true statement. The columns of A span R M. Okay, let's let's take a look at the two by two case to give us a little bit of intuition behind this. So we'll give the two by two case. So if, if that is, if that is true, then that means that A is a two by two matrix. It contains the components A11, A12, A21, and A22. And that means that since A is two by two, that means that, uh, we are actually, our, our columns, each of our columns are two by one. The columns of A span RM. So, so we're saying that let's suppose that this is a true statement, that these two vectors allow us to travel anywhere in, in two dimensions that we would like to go. So that means that if I just refer to this as the A1 vector and I refer to this as the A2 vector, what I can do is I can identify a location, say this location here, I can scale A11, A21, I can scale the A1 vector and we'll, we'll just say that this is C1 times A1 and then I can tip to tail put the vector, some scalar multiple vector, excuse me, scalar multiple of the vector A2 onto the tip of C1, A1, and I can arrive at any location I want in, in R2. So this representation is C1, A1 plus C2, A2. This is our tip to tail representation of, of vectors. I can identify any location I want. Now I'm not limited to that. I can pick a location down say in the third quadrant and again I can suggestively find some sort of linear combination of these two vectors again to arrive at, at that location. That's the claim that I'm making here, that the columns at A do span R2. Okay, so this is R2 that we're looking at. We're in two dimensions. We have two axes, an X and a Y. Okay, if that is true, we're going to claim also that AX equals B has a solution for every B in RM. Okay, so this is us unpacking statement one. Let's, let's now look at statement two. Why is this true? AX equals B has a solution for every B in, in our case, this is going to be R2. Right, we're just limiting ourselves logically to two dimensions. All right. So AX, we know that, that that is going to be the A matrix times some components in the X vector. Now let me just refer to those as those components as C1 and C2. Well that right there is going to give me C1 times A11, A21 by matrix vector multiplication. That column gets scaled by that scalar. This column gets scaled by this scalar and the results get added 
together. Now we've already referred to A11, A21. We've called that, we've just decided to call that A1. And we've decided to call A12, A22 the vector A2. Now we can see that there's a clear connection here that geometrically our picture suggests that we could get to anyone anywhere in R2 that we want. That's, you know, again, when any one of these is true, we've assumed that statement one is true. Well, then statement two is true also because the vector B is just where we end up, right? So in this example up here, this was the resulting vector that we could refer to as B. I'll put quotes around that because that is just some location in, in two dimensions. And because A1 and A2 take me to any location in two dimensions, that means I can certainly get to the location of, of B. So it will have a solution for every vector B in R2 because we span all of R2. So all I've done is I, I've rewritten statement two so that it shows that AX is simply a linear combination of the columns of A. AX is just that. AX is the span of the columns of A. And by doing that, I've just shown that statement one and statement two are, are logically equivalent. Very nice. The third statement says for every B in RM, so for every location in R2, that location is a linear combination of the columns of A. Well, hey, that's, that's the same thing as statement one, right? And statement two combined together. So for any location that I pick, B can be arrived at by scaling the columns of, of A by some very specific numbers to arrive at that location. So I'm not even going to get take the, the time to really ex, expand out on this statement here because it kind of takes what one and two have already illustrated and just puts it in different type of sentence. Now in statement four, the reduced row echelon form of A contains a leading one in every row. Okay, now this is gonna be a little bit different for non two by two cases, but let's think about what this means. In statement, so statement three is kind of a combo of one and two. Statement four, says that the reduced row echelon form of A contains a leading one in every row. Okay, so we're saying that AX equals B has a solution for every B in R2, and therefore AX equals B, AX equals B is really just going to be the statement A11 times C1 plus a12 times C2, A21 times C1 plus A22 times C2, and that's going to equal these components B1 and B2. So I'll just write the components of B as B1 and B2. Now as a system of linear equations, what we're trying to solve for is C1 and C2. So those are our, like our X and Y. So in matrix form, we would write this as A11, A12, and then augmented by B1, this is just our equal sign, A21, A22, and B2. And now if this has a solution for every vector B, we already know that to be true because of statements one through three, then what we're gonna end up with is a, a value for for C1, I shouldn't call that B1 anymore, but this is gonna be some number here, and we're going to end up with zero, one, and some potentially different number here. And so every row is going to have a leading one because every row in this case is going to give us the value of each of the two variables. In this case, again, those value variables would be C1 and 
and C2. So that again satisfies the reduced row echelon form. Now, if we didn't end up with a leading one, then if we had, for example, a zero here, well, then if this was not equal to zero, then the system would be inconsistent. It would have no solution at all. And well, that's not consistent with what we've written in statements one through three. Okay, it doesn't have a solution in this case. So what if this row had something other than, it, it had zero, zero, zero. Well, in that case, that would imply that, for example, here, if we had one zero and then something, that that means C1 would have a distinct value of whatever that question mark value is, but then C2 would be free. And if C2 was free, that means we would have infinitely many solutions. And this is a very subtle, subtle thing here. We're saying has a solution, meaning it has one solution. And in this case, if we did not have that leading one there, we would have infinitely many solutions. So without getting any more technical here, this basically shows how these four statements are related for the two by two case. We could make similar arguments for larger cases, and this is something left to a more advanced linear algebra class, but at least when you have one of these statements, you know you can from that infer that the other three statements would be true. It would also be true that if the reduced row echelon form of A contains a leading one in every row, that statements one through three would also be true. So key here is, if any one of these statements is true, they are all true.